my name is Jackie Fry. I'm the Director of Product Development for BookNet Canada. And it's my pleasure to introduce the panel on self-publishing and new opportunities. Um, so our first panelist, uh, Rebecca Albani, is the Publisher Relations Manager at Bowker. She has worked in both publisher, publishing and book um, and publisher metadata, and she currently assists large and small publishers with making their data more discoverable to consumers. Rebecca speaks regularly to both self-publishers and traditional publishers about enhancing bibliographic data. Uh, next to Rebecca, we have Douglas Gibson, a uh, name familiar, no doubt, to everyone in this room. Douglas Gibson started the first editorial imprint in Canada, Douglas Gibson Books at McClellan and Stewart in 1986. Um, he had previously held editorial positions with Doubleday Canada and Macmillan of Canada, where he was also served as publisher. Douglas retired from McClellan and Stewart in 2008, although his imprint endures, and he continues to shepherd authors through the publishing system. His authors have won every major Canadian book prize. Douglas has, is also himself a published author. His book, Stories About Storytellers, was published by ECW in 2011. Sitting beside Douglas Gibson is Valerie Gray. She is the executive director, editor, I beg your pardon, for Mira Books, an imprint of Harlequin. Her career has included work not only in publishing, but in the areas of education, broadcasting, and film. Since coming to publishing over a dozen years ago, she has assisted in the careers of several New York Times bestselling authors, including Bella Andre and Robin Carr. She has worked with many authors who write in a variety of genres, from romance to commercial literary fiction. And our final member of the panel is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, the Director of Self-Publishing and Author Solutions at Kobo. Previously, he worked as a bookseller in virtually every possible bookstore environment. Mark was part of the team that launched Kobo Writing Life, a DIY self-publishing portal for authors and small publishers. He sits on the Canadian Booksellers Association Executive Board and the BookNet Canada Board of Directors, and he is an author, an editor, a passionate bookseller, and an avid reader. Please welcome the panelists. Thanks. So I have a few slides that I'm, go that I'm gonna go through. Um, what I'm gonna talk to you guys about is what is a self-publisher? I'm gonna give you some statistics that Bowker has on the US self-publishing. Talk about a survey that we did for self-publishing service providers, both in the US and in Canada, and then do a little comparison between the <coughs> answers that we got back from the questionnaires we sent out. <coughs> so first, what is a self-publisher? Self-publisher is someone that wants to have their title published but and decides to go with a self-service um, self provider rather than a normal or a regular uh, publisher, a literary agent, friend request, something like that. So first on the US market, um, Bowker did a study, and we have all of the ISBN statistics, but um, here you can see that from 2006 to 2011, the growth in um, self-publishing, both in ebook and in print, and you can see that there's a large growth between 2010 and 2011 in the um, production. And it's no surprise that within those statistics, ebook has a larger growth than print for self-publishing. So, what we found is that the, it, there's, a, there's a large amount, the large, um, large firms for both ebooks and print. So the top one was Smashwords for ebooks and Create Space for print. And you'll see later on that there's a lot more available in the US market than in the Canadian market from what I could find. So Bowker surveys consumers regarding their purchase habits. Um, here we asked readers how they became aware of their most recent books. And for self-publishing titles, we can see that authors effectively reach more readers with online um, excerpts, with recommend, re uh, retailer recommendations, and with cons customer review, sorry. So this is all great news for people that are self-publishing because these are items that they have control over. Um, this chart shows what people why people actually purchase the titles that they purchased. So it, these eight items 
are all great news also for self-published because these are also items that they have control over. So for someone that's self-publishing, if they take a look at these and they see that it's excerpts and it's price and availability, that these are things that they have control over. So self-publishing, it's easier for them to get their titles out there. So what we did was last year we surveyed the self-publishing providers in the U.S. market. We sent them a questionnaire, it was a long spreadsheet, asked them to fill out the services that they provide to the, public, to the authors. Um, and these are the survey respondents that we got back in the United States. I also recently did this on the Canadian market. Now due to timing constraints and the amount of research that was involved with it, um, I was only able to send them out to about 10 or 11 providers that I could find online doing my own research. But I was able to get six back and um, it's actually very interesting, the statistics that we got back. So the services that we reviewed are the editing and design services, marketing services, and content creation and distribution, which would be the product creation, the metadata, and the distribution. So in Canada, there was everyone that came back out of the six respondents, 100% of them said that produc production services, they provided uh, print on demand, short run printing, color printing and ebook conversion. The next step down was 83% where they provided pre-publishing services such as copy editing, title or chapter header recommendations and project management. And then for the metadata services, they said that they supplied the ISBN and the barcode. Um, for the distribution services, it was they distributed the print and the ebook. And for marketing services, they helped provide the marketing copy. In the U.S. market, these are the top services that were provided. So it was the ebook conversion was the first service that they that the first highest service, and then it was supplying the ISBN, um, doing the print on demand, the custom cover designs, and then the barcodes. So marketing and services, um, there is a long list that we ask them to fill out to ask to let us know if they provide this or not. So it's interesting to see, and it's probably because of the amount of answers I got back and who I was able to send it to in the Canadian market. But here you can see it's kind of like a lot of steps. It looks like a ladder going up kind of. Um, but you can see that the lowest or what they didn't really provide was a media list, a Hollywood pitch, a virtual book tour, and um, the advertising bundles. But the, the highest, what they did provide to authors was marketing copy, um, assistance in marketing, media kits, and social media. Now in the US, it's a little bit more staggered due to the number of respondents that we got back. But it is interesting to look that what was low in the Canadian market, the virtual book tour and the media list, is also fairly low in the US market, although it's a little bit different because of the numbers. And as well as what was high in the Canadian market, it's higher on the US list, but it's not the number one. So the number one was press releases and website designs where that wasn't as high in the Canadian market. So while there were differences, they did kind of, they, while there were differences, there are similarities, just a matter of how many respondents there were. So the, the last slide shows the comparison of pre-production offerings that we asked. Um, this is actually pretty interesting because you can see that some of them have a large difference between the Canadian market and the US market, and some of them, they were kind of similar. So. Um, some of the similar, the similar ones were the, um, the rewriting and the keying of content where the formatting of ebooks had a large difference. So it's definitely interesting to see the difference between the Canadian and the US market. Um, and it could depend on if I was able to get more respondents on the Canadian market, maybe the, the findings would be different. Maybe they would be the same. Um, I'm still working on trying to get people to send back the surveys that I had sent out and see if I can find more on the Canadian market. But due to the timing of everything, I wasn't able to get as many back. So that's all that I have for the statistics. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. Send the survey results back <laughs> to this woman. I'm going to be talking to you today wearing three different hats. First, the traditional publisher hat and I'm even wearing the tie, doing the whole traditional publisher thing for you. It was exactly 45 years ago this week, almost to the day, that I started work in publishing at Doubleday Canada as a trainee editor. 
And that meant that I started out reading unsolicited manuscript, which indoctrinated me right from the start in the traditional publisher's way of looking at authors. The slush pile. If you want to know how, author, how publishers, even although intellectually they recognize that it all starts with somebody writing a book, that's the lifeblood of publishing, yet the very phrase, the slush pile, tells you everything you want to know about the traditional publisher's way of looking at author's efforts. And I was indoctrinated that way, and I dealt with the slush pile, and I didn't deal with it very well, as publishers traditionally do not deal with it well. We, reject, we rejected books too quickly and made hasty mistakes. And the authors, more than 95% of them who were eventually rejected, put up with this sloppy yet hasty system because there was nowhere else for them to go almost nowhere else, because there were unscrupulous vanity publishers, and that's a phrase that's as telling as slush pile, vanity publishers who advertised in writers' magazines that they would take and publish your manuscript, a process that ended up with you getting a garage full of badly printed and very expensive books. So the entire traditional publisher's approach to new authors was based on two compounding forms of arrogance. First, the plenty of fish in the sea theory. And second, they need us because they have nowhere else to go. All changed, changed utterly. A terrible beauty is born. <laughs> now the question is, what can the traditional publisher do to persuade writers, unknown or famous, that they need a publisher instead of self-publishing with the help of fine people like my friend Mark Lefebvre, who's been very helpful to me in preparing for this. We've just heard from Rebecca just how widespread self-publishing is and how the practice, you saw the graphs, is really growing. So what do traditional publishers have to offer authors? First, objectivity what some might call the curatorial role. Publishing House is willing to stake its reputation on this book as opposed to the thousands of us, others out there, all of which are doted on by their authors who can only su offer subjective praise for their own books. And that, I think, is still and always will be the main asset that a publisher has. What else can a publisher do to justify his or her role to the author? First, by saying flatly, you come with us and we'll do the publishing, leaving you free to do the writing. Authors tend to choose their way of life because they like to write. The self-publishing studies I've read, and Mark may debate this later, indicate that running the business takes up almost 50% of their the author's time, time that could be spent writing rather than juggling with copy editors or sending out review copies or, or, or. You write, we'll publish, and look after everything else. It's going to sound very attractive to many authors. The second part of that approach is to say boldly, you're a professional writer. Our editing will make you a better writer with a better book to sell. Now, what I'm going to say may seem counterintuitive, it certainly seems to be the opposite of what most publishers are doing now. Faced with very real financial problems, they're cutting back on their editorial staff and on the editorial time allowed per book. And I would argue that this is precisely the wrong way to go. Publishers can offer a great deal by way of added value. What will certainly be appreciated by a truly professional writer what they can do is their offer is their ability to make books better by skilled and patient editing. And my own experience, and my book talks about this, how surprised I was to find that really experienced writers like Robertson Davies, Hugh McLennan, etc., as professionals, really welcomed editorial help. Now, I'd also suggest that modern technology might set publishers considering narrowing the range of the books they publish. 
because it's now so much easier to drill down to find niche markets that maybe that would be a smart move for publishers to take. And that would allow them to attract authors from that area, which might be knitting, it might be wrestling, and it would allow the publisher to explo exploit that market even better with profits all round. And I'm an old hand who still gets involved in the game on a freelance basis, as, as you've heard. But the great weakness in the publisher's case, besides the fact that 10% royalties don't sound as good as 50%, is that the whole sales and marketing approach of traditional publishers is based on a great lie. And the great lie is when the publisher says to the author, we care just as much about your book as you do. This is not true. The publisher, as you know, has a whole list of books to watch over and promote. The author has only one and cares only about that one. And after the book has had its moment in the publishing season sun, it's an old book and it's all over. And every author slowly comes to realize this sad truth. And here I put on my second hat as my author hat. None of what I say here should be construed as criticism of my publisher, ECW Press, <laughs> <coughs> who have been very good to me and my book. In fact, they've provided a useful model that others might even develop as a selling point to future authors. You see, I, like many highly intelligent authors, am not technologically gifted. So my brilliant editor, Jennifer Noch, has made a point of supplying me with technical help, for example, in setting up my website, helping me with my blog, and incorporating streams from CBC radio interviews where I impersonate Hugh McLennan, and so on, even devising a map of my promotional travels. So I've been very lucky, and I'm very pleased with that support. But my days as a publisher, and I held that title for 25 years, had showed me that the old ways of promoting a book no longer worked. I hated the idea of my 40 years in Canadian publishing being promoted for only a few weeks and then becoming an old book. So I started to think and behave like a self-publisher. I'd already contracted with the wonderful Globe and Mail cartoonist Anthony Jenkins to do the caricatures of these 21 authors so that I, before I approached authors, I said, here's the deal. The chapters will begin with this caricature, and we're a package. And happily, ECW saw the advantages of that, and on we went. And I knew, and I secured the rights from him to use them not only in the book, but in promoting the book, since I was already laying odd plans. I knew you had to do something special to give a book a long life. So I turned my book into a one-man stage play, where instead of dressing up as Charles Dickens or Mark Twain, I dressed up as Doug Gibson. I was born for the role. And I've taken my show, Stories About Storytellers, an evening with Doug Gibson, right across the country. So far, 45 performances, eight provinces, PEI coming up in August, Newfoundland on the horizon, I'll make 10. And all of this is done with ECW helping by passing along interest from literary festivals, bookstores, libraries, or, or, uh, or universities, and then me setting up each event, like a vaudeville tour. Now, I'm going into this sort of detail because I think this is the way of the future. Not that authors should produce stage plays, but that the author will take a very active, ongoing, creative role in their promotion just like a self-published author, but with the helpful, supportive involvement of the publisher too. So the old lines between what the author does and what the publisher does are blurring, and I think everyone should recognize that. And in that context, it's important to talk about control. That's a word I find coming up again and again in all of the discussions about why people get into self-publishing. They like the control. Well, they like controlling the way the book looks, the timing of the publication, the pricing, the instant changes they can make there. So here are some questions I pose to traditional publishers to think about. 
faced this, the, with this wave of self-publishing and with the author's much quoted desire for as much control as possible, what areas of joint control are you willing to give up? Will you, by contract, allow the author to come up with the title and subtitle? Will you, by contract, allow them to uh, pre uh, introduce the internal page design or allow them to choose the cover? This is, this is serious stuff. Certainly, you see, I think there has been a shift in the balance of power. And the wise publisher, I think, is going to have to work hard to find ways to give the author as much control as they sensibly can. And the trick will be to do this while gently impressing on the author the professional experience that the publisher is bringing to the table. And time for my third hat publisher of Terry Follis. Terry is a good friend, such a good friend that although we regularly have dinner together, his house, our house, uh, when he was working on his book that became The Best Laid Plans, he never once said, um, Doug, I wonder, would you take a look at my book? He didn't want to trade on our friendship. And then he ran into the slush pile problem, and after 12 months, he said, the hell with it and he went to iUniverse, and he published the book himself. And he was at home one day when he happened to read the rules for entry to the Stephen Leacock Prize for Humor, and self-published books qualify, but you had to enter 10 copies. The last 10 copies of his book happened to be right there, so he sent them off, and the rest I is history. He won the Stephen Leacock Award. I was at the lunch, the Leacock lunch, supporting another more traditionally published author and he won and I went over and said Terry you really need a publisher now and I read the book loved it and we rushed to bring the book out uh, in the fall and Terry I should tell you had sold about 700 copies on his own before the Leacock shortlist uh, brought him another 800 sales the traditional way of approaching such a situation, and I'm embarrassed to tell you about this, was for an author to say, I've already sold 1,500 copies, and publishers would say, oh, well, I'm sorry, we're not interested then, you've spoiled the market. That was the way we thought back then. And now, of course, I we were smart enough to get involved in publishing Terry's already published book, and it won the Canada Reads competition, it has now sold over 100,000 copies. Terry's written another two books. There's another one coming out this fall if he and I do our work fast. And we didn't, he didn't destroy the market by self-publishing his book. Thank heavens that the Terry Follis experience taught this particular old dog new tricks and showed us that there are indeed many interesting ways for self-publishing and traditional publishing to touch and protect and greet each other and not remain two solitudes. Thank you. Well, I've got a whole different perspective on things. I work for um, Harlequin, which I'm sure all of you have heard. Maybe some of you have been lucky enough to read some of our books. Um, we. Um, up until a few years ago, were what Douglas refers to as a traditional publisher. Um, we would uh, put an author under contract, we would publish uh, his or her books, <coughs> and uh, these went out in print, and, and that's, that's how business was, was done. I just want to speak to the slush pile. <laughs> okay. Because Douglas is right, every publishing house ha has has books that come in that um, uh, authors and agents uh, want someone to take a look at. And um, I can tell you that some of the best books I've published have come from that slush pile. So I wouldn't want any, any, any uh, prospective writer out there to think that uh, it's all for naught, because it isn't. A few years ago, the, uh, the business of e-publishing um, became a phenomenon. And Harlequin was one of the first publishers to publish 
in the E format at the same time as the print format. And, you know, in truth, there was a lot of unease in our house because we we're all trying to figure out what does this mean and how is that going to affect us and what does it mean to our bottom line. And, you know, I'll be honest, I think most publishers were in a, in a bit of a tizzy about it. Um, trying to figure out market share, what does it mean, where are these authors going, why are they self-publishing, why aren't they coming to us. But I think, um, from my vantage point anyway, the last year or so, things have settled out a little bit. And personally, I'm of the opinion that there is room for everything. There is room for the self-published author, there is room for an author who wants to be uh, published traditionally, and there is room for the hybrid, which is an author who has a foot in both worlds. But in my view, the consumer is king. And the consumer tells us what they want to read and how they want to read it and where they want to read it. And any responsible publisher or self-published author is going to be cognizant of those rules of the marketplace and try to deliver what the consumer wants. And of course, the consumer's um, needs and interests are changing you know, monthly. But that's the great thing about it. It's, it's challenging, but it's fun. It's fantastic to go out and look, wow, this is what's going on today, and it's so different from a year ago. And I think we're all here to serve the book, and whether it's um, a novella or whether it's, um, what did they call it in the panel before? What was it called? An uh, e-book. An e-book, no, no. Uh, it was the, the term that Nathan had such trouble with. E-single. Yeah. E-singles, yeah. right. Yeah. It, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter wh what you want to call these things. People want to read. And our job as publishers or self-published authors is to provide the very best content we can for those people. So, you know, at Harlequin, we're, you know, we're <coughs> you know, picking ourselves up and dusting ourselves off and, and looking at, at the new world and trying to see what we can do. And um, in the last year, uh, I, I did something that you know would never have been considered uh, even 18 months ago, and that was to buy um, an author who was already um, a digital phenomenon, and she was not interested in giving up her ebook e rights, her digital rights, and and why would she be? But I could see an opportunity there because. You know, people who are publish, publishing in the e-format is fantastic. Go out there. Bella Andre has sold over a million copies of her books in about two years. I'm betting that there are going to be many, many uh, consumers out there who want to read those books, but they want to read them in print format. So that's the deal I did with Bella Andre and her agent. And we will publish her ebooks, but we'll have them in print. And you might say to yourself, well, why would she want to do that? Well, the better question is, why wouldn't she? Why wouldn't you want, as an author, have your books out there in the e format and then have them out there in print all over uh, the English speaking world? I think you'd, I think you'd want that. So, you know, those are sort of some of my top line ideas about why I'm here this afternoon. Um, I know Mark has some really interesting things to say, and I'd certainly love to take any questions at the end. Thank you. Um, I'm a hybrid author. Uh, there's four books on the table in front of me. Two of them are self-published. Two of them are traditionally published. Try to guess what's what. Um, I. I have been a bookseller for 20 years. Uh, I had been trained to roll my eyes every time a self-published author brought a book into the bookstore. I was also uh, the second bookstore bookseller in the world to, to discover the genius of Terry Fallis when he was self-publishing and he called and I actually took a look at it and I was delighted to watch his rise. 
been delighted to watch the rise of so many amazing authors who made it through that slush pile. I'm going to say that right now, because of the advent of digital publishing and how easy it is for authors and the frustration that a lot of authors have with not being able to get through the, the gatekeepers, is that the slush pile has moved from a back room in a major warehouse uh, uh, connected to a publisher and into an online catalog near you. Um, but as Valerie pointed out, the, um, the reader is, uh, is king, um, w which is a key here. I, I approach having been a bookseller for a long, long time and having learned the lure of the self-publishing space and the joy that publishers actually have in discovering the undiscovered writer, it's a phenomenal experience. Um, I see self-publishing not as a threat to traditional publishing, but as an opportunity for traditional publishing. And with that, I'll say, um, if ignored, it could potentially be a threat to some business models. And that's why I'm delighted to see uh, what you know, uh, Douglas Gibson Books did with Terry Fallis by recognizing authors uh, to move them into that space. Uh, you know, for Valerie at Harlequin taking a chance and saying, "No, I think sh you know there's a there's a business model to be said for taking this success in a digital space and doing what we can in the print world." Uh, of the self-published books that uh, I put on the table here, both of my self-published books are available in virtually every online uh, system around the world all the time. Not necessarily the case for my traditionally published books, but I'll tell you one thing, and God bless Dundurn, but I mean, my, my Dundurn Press book was actually in Costco, which I, as a self-published author, could never do. Are you kidding me? I was talking to Eric Jensen uh, earlier about, uh, and, and no, I can't take your EDI order for my self-published book, but Dundurn can. Um, so that was one of the things that is, is important. Um, a couple things that I tell people when they look at me, especially my friends from traditional publishing, uh, if they see me as a threat uh, and, and they see me talking to their authors, uh, I say, you know, at Kobo, we love authors no matter how they come to us. Our job is to connect the reader with the writer and, and that, that reading of content. So we love the authors, whether they come from traditional publishing, whether they come from some of the literary agencies that are taking advantage of the self-publishing tools that we've built, or whether they're coming from self traditional, it doesn't matter at the end of the day, good content is what we're there to put in the hands of readers. Um, I wanted to outline, and I would jump to the jump to conversation, but I wanted to outline one particular way that self-publishing authors can help uh, traditional publishing. And Kevin J. Anderson, who's a, a science fiction author from the US, he's a New York Times bestseller. His example is one that I think is one of the things we can learn from. He has published 110 different books there are books that are out of print and it is not economically feasible for the publisher to uh, print them. They're not gonna sell enough units to be worthwhile printing. Kevin's rights reverted back to him. He has self-published them and lo and behold, he's not only making money off of books that he couldn't make money off before, but his front list titles from his traditional publishers are selling more because more people are discovering his earlier works and he's thus selling more. I have seen the case myself where my traditionally published books help me sell more of my uh, uh, self-published books and my self-published books are helping me sell more of my traditionally published books. So I fully, uh, I want to just hug you guys because of the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, you know, you talk about uh, touch and protect and greet each other and, uh, uh, there's room for everything. Uh, I really strongly believe in that. Do let's chat. Do you want a <laughs> hug? Yeah, let's <laughs> hug. <laughs> so, should we at this point invite questions? questions? Nathan. Nathan. <laughs> Okay, I, I, if I may, I'll 
reply briefly because I think Mark is the guy who's going to be able to talk well, about. I talk to Nathan all the time. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but you're right, of course. I, I'm not sure th how the author who's tempted towards self-publishing is going to be impressed by the news to the publisher, we put a lot of money into this, you know, and we're risking our own money. So th that's, those were the argument, the points of debate that I was pushing that, that uh, I think should impress any, any author. Hey, we're, we're choosing you. We're, we're getting behind you. We're putting our brand behind you. And hey, we can help make your book better. I think these are very good. Now, you're absolutely right that the, uh, the key business point is, hey, the publisher is risking a lot of money, and <laughs> I know about this. <laughs> and you're right, the, the piles of dollar bills in, in the books in the warehouse, it's true. But uh, I'm not sure how impressive an argument that is to the, the person who's been sold by, by Mark on how comparatively easy it is to uh, bring out your, your and finance your own uh, independently self-published book. I, I'm going to bring Valerie into this discussion as well because um, successful self-published authors do treat it very much like a business and recognize that immediately from the start. Bella Andre invests thousands of dollars into her books. That is why she's a successful uh, self-published author. It's not just she wrote something she thought was cool and she slapped it up. She invested in editorial, she invested in design, she invested in a professional product, and I bet you, because she is a very sharp cookie, she sat down with a calculator and figured out when exactly she was gonna make her money back. And yes, publishers mitigate risk, that's one of the things they do, and they do those calculations. How many are we gonna have to sell to make it worthwhile? And successful self-published -pu authors are no different. I think it was Richard Nash, uh, a few years ago at, at, at BookNet, at one of the tech forums, had said, uh, publishing started as, as a small group of middle-aged white men in suits publishing each other's works. What, what's that but what self-publishing is, in, in, in a sense, except we're not all rich, middle-class white men in suits. I mean, some of us don't even have ties. So. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I mean, it, publishing started that way, and really successful self-publishing takes the same yeah. business approach, sometimes yeah. with a little bit more of an agile approach, and I think quick to market, was it uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nick in the last uh, panel talked about the author approached with an idea that they wanted to get to market quickly. And, and, and I've seen a lot of uh, publishers embrace that and that's been really, really exciting. And when a publisher doesn't embrace it, I mean Bella, Bella's idea for the Sullivan series, she pitched it to her publisher and they said, nah, that'll never sell, they don't, don't want to read about a family like that. And she said, well, you know, I'm going to give it a shot. I really believe in this. I've done the math, I've done the calculations. And then lo and behold, uh, it comes full circle where a really, really brilliant, intelligent publisher uh, said, I think we can do something good with this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just to um, take, take up your question, Nathan, about um, uh, investing and, and, and spending on, on authors. Um, in our house, we have an acquisition meeting every week, every Tuesday afternoon. And we sit down and we consider projects that e um, editors like myself bring forward. And they could be nonfiction or they could be teen or they could be um, any number of things. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's a group decision. We all read the material and we have people from marketing and sales and the VPs and we all, we're all there and we hammer it out and we we run P&Ls beforehand as, you know, as, as best we can based on the information we have. Mm -hmm. And, um, but the, the, you know, the, the, all of these things are important, but the thing that drives it most often is the passion for the editor. Because the editor is the one who's gonna come to that meeting and sell that book. And if he or she really believes in it, she's gonna get other people on board. Um, but it's, it's uh, it, you know, it's an investment, and advance is an investment. And publishers like, like mine, um, when we um, buy an author, it's not because we just want to publish one book. We're, I'm there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. um, I've got authors that I've been working with for 10 and more years, um, people that I 
I believed in. I knew there was a talent there, and in a couple of cases, it's taken a while, but they've hit the NYT list, which in my business is the benchmark of success. And I feel good about that. Not everything you do is, is gonna be the right decision. I mean, we goofed up a couple of times where, you know, somebody wanted a book and no, no, we don't think so. And, and then of course, you know, it's been really gutting to see somebody else take it and do something with it. But that's business and, and it is business. And the self-publishing author, it's business. And you gotta do it, whatever you can do to make that business a success. The, the world loves stories of publishers screwing up. And <laughs> you know, George Orwell's Animal Farm was rejected by a stiff note saying, we do not publish children's books. <laughs> and we all know about what happened to J.K. Rowling at the start. So yes, it's, it's an imprecise business and we all have our share of shame. But other questions? Yeah, I think there's a question there. Yeah. You know, um, not there is not much of a difference. Um, I, for, you know, just use two two kind of good examples here. I work with two big authors, Bella Andre and Robin Carr, and I support them equally. I um, advocate for them equally. I fight for money for them for marketing and PR and other opportunities. And I think that's pretty standard for most editors. Um, once, once you've got an author, she's, she or he is, is your responsibility and you have to do absolutely everything you can do to advocate for them so that when their book comes out, it's gonna have um, strong nets and long tails. I think there was uh, one more question and then we're almost done. Yeah. Hi, Deanna, Hi, Deanna from HarperCollins. Um, <laughs> I, I really like the idea that, that, that you feel that there is room in the world for both self-publishing and traditional publishing. The question that I have for anyone on this panel is, how do you influence discoverability when you're a self-published author versus how you would approach that client that comes to you? I mean, it's, it's very easy, not, not to say it's easy, but it's, I, I have an in with Nathan at Hobo. <laughs> Okay, so for um, uh, the, the question is basically, um, just, just to repeat it, is, is what can a self-published author do for discoverability that you know, HarperCollins, for example, can't do in terms of all of the things that they do to get discoverability for authors? And the answer is in my $100 self-published book, Deanna, and you're gonna have to buy it. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. Uh, that, therein lies, I was at a writer's uh, group last night in Stratford talking for two hours, and we barely touched upon the things that can be done. But one thing I will tell you, and I think, uh, Doug, as an author, you can say this yourself, is nobody cares as much about your book as you. And I know my publisher, my e editors love my book, but I invest just as much energy in my traditionally published book uh, and, and promoting it as I do in my self-published book and promoting it. And my publisher does invest and has access to Nathan. I actually don't even have access to him. He won't even talk to me about my books. <laughs> so. That's crazy. <laughs> but no, I, you, are, you are right. That is a, that is a full-time job. And Doug, I do agree with you that it is at least 50% of an author's work. And oh my God, three, two, one, red light. <laughs>
Thank you very much. We were. We'll <laughs> <get to laughs> <the next day. laughs>